Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah, and today you were handed two things when you walked in. This is our bulletin, and there is a lot of good information on it, so please make sure you pay attention to that. And then at the bottom is what we call our flap. We would love if you filled this out and then put it in one of the offering boxes on your way out. I mean, we were also handed our communion. Just hold on to that, and we're going to take it together in the middle of the service. We are still collecting boxes of Fruity Pebbles for Little Galilee Christian Camp. If you would like to bring in a box of those, you can place them in the coat closet. This Friday, we are having a fundraiser for Bright Beginnings Preschool at Tailwinds in Finley. If you're interested in going to this, please check out the details on your bulletin or contact Amy Uphall. Beginning next Sunday at the 10.30 hour, we have a class called FCC 101. It's going to last for four Sundays, and this class is for anyone who is either new to the church or just wants more information and wants to know more about our church. So if you are interested, it begins next Sunday, FCC 101 at the 10.30 hour. Parent dedication is coming up on May 5th. If you would like to participate in this, there is a sign-up sheet in the lobby. If you have questions about it, you can just go ahead and call the church office. On Saturday, May 11th, we are having a day of prayer. Our church will be open from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. And during those hours, we will have people here ready to pray with you. Um, if you just want to come in and pray on your own, that's fine too. We also have the prayer corner if you want to come in and pray over those prayer requests. But we would just love for you to come that day and be a part of our prayer day. If you are graduating either high school or college this year, we would love if you could send in a picture. Um, you can either email the church office or email me, but we need that picture by May 5th because we want to recognize you on May 19th, which will be our grad Sunday. Our student ministry is having their final fundraiser for CIY. This is called Muffins for Mother's Day. If you would like to order some, you can do that today in the lobby. Those were all of your announcements. There were a lot of them, and I left out some details, so please make sure you're looking at your bulletin, and we will see you next week. Good morning, FCC. Would you stand with us as we begin our worship this morning?
from 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in his mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows. Such boundless grace. 
all that you do for us, provide for us, all that you give us. Lord, we just pray over this service, over this message, Lord, that it would just change us, that it would renew us as we go out and do what you've called us to do. We ask all this in your name. Amen. We're in week three of looking at the Lord's Prayer together, and uh, two weeks ago when we started the series, we uh, we kicked it off uh, talking about the, this idea that we want to be a praying church, and there's there's tools that we've put with this. Um, there's a prayer guide in the back on the table that we've put together that we would love for you to have and uh, be a resource to help you uh, begin to build a rhythm of prayer in your life. To, to, because as we started the series, we said that the disciples came to Jesus with a question. That, Show us how to pray. Teach us. And they, they had noticed that there was this pattern in Jesus' life and his ministry where he would, he would go away to be alone with the Father, and then, and then he would return and, and do amazing things, that he, he would heal, that he would do miracles. And, and they, they, instead of asking, like, show us how to do that stuff, they just said, there's something that you get from the Father, and we want to have that connection with him. And so we're, we're digging into this, and uh, it, it's important to remember that Jesus isn't teaching us what to pray here. He's teaching us how to pray. He's teaching us how. And so in, in that vein, with the, that in mind, I, I wanted to take a moment. I had a conversation this week with someone um, and uh, had an opportunity to pray with her, but I also just asked her, could we pray uh, for you as a congregation? And uh, that person was Virginia Wall. And uh, she has uh, a lung disease, pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, it, it does not have a cure, um, and it's, it's progressed quite a bit. And, um, and so in talking with her, there are two things that, that we're praying for her, two things. One, if, if, if God would heal her completely, I mean, there would be no doubt. There would be absolutely no doubt that it was from him. Uh, and what an amazing witness that would be. But, uh, but also, she just asked that uh, also that maybe it would just plateau. Um, it, it's amazing to sit with, um, with one of God's saints and to hear the, someone who's been faithful in their life just share, like, I'm ready. I just, I'd, I'd love... There's a couple more things I'd love to do with my family. And one is her granddaughter is going to be getting married next month, and she wants to be a part of that. And so if you would join me, uh, we're going to pray for Virginia now. Father, uh, thank you so much for Virginia, for her life, for her friendship, for the, the number of years that she has served you so faithfully, God. And Father, we pray uh, today in the name of Jesus that you would heal her body, God. That you would heal her lungs of this disease, Father. And, and we pray it because uh, as, we, as we pray now even, Father, we just recognize that uh, that would be such an incredible witness to you and, and who you are, to your power, Father, um, and all for your glory. And God, ultimately, as, as we prayed together this week, Father, we w- we're praying for, for your will uh, to be done. And so, Father, if, if your will, will is for her to be completely healed on, on, the, on the other side of heaven and not on this earth, Father, what we do pray right now, God, is that you would um, please, Father, just give her this, this plateau. Father, in the progress of this disease, that she can she could still spend time uh, with her family, precious time, God. And in that, Father, I thank you for her witness. I thank you for the ways that uh, she still is looking to be faithful and to point to you and and all that she's doing. And and God, I just um, I thank you for that. I pray all of these things. We pray them together here, God, in Jesus' name, Amen. Um. And there's, there, there is a lot when it, when it comes to prayer that I think we, we miss. This idea that, as we set it up, that Jesus was saying, man, this is, 
in teaching you how to pray, what I want you to understand, even in the beginning, our Father, hallowed be your name, that it's about a relationship and a perspective. Um, I heard this story. Uh, it was one of my grandpa's favorites, so I, I know I run the risk of maybe you've heard it, but um, there's this story. I, I love the Masters, uh, the golf tournament. Every year I, I watch it. There's something about that piano music that plays. And like I told people, I, I think Jim Nance narrated a portion of my childhood um, sitting in, in my grandpa's living room watching the Masters with him and stuff. And, and so the story, as the story goes, it was a story about Moses and Jesus and, and this older guy that went golfing one day. And they came up on a par three. It was a par three, 180-yard hole. And, uh, and so Moses, he steps up. There was water uh, in between the tee box and the hole. Mo- Moses steps up with his five iron. He didn't have a, a four iron in his bag, but he said, I think I can get it there. There was a stiff wind uh, blowing back toward him. And he, as he hit his ball, uh, the wind just knocked it down. It went in the water. And so Moses parted the water, and uh, he walked up to his ball. He chipped it up and down from, for his par. As the story goes, then Jesus stepped up, and he had his four iron that day. He said, surely, I get it there. And, and he, hit, he hit his ball, and it, the wind knocked it down. It went in the water, and Jesus just walked out on the water, you know, called his ball to the surface, chipped it up and down par. And so the old guy stepped up, and, and he hit his shot. It was ugly. It was not a good shot at all. Uh, it barely made it to the water, but as it got there, a fish jumped out of the water, got the ball in its mouth. Uh, as the fish was descending to the water, an eagle swooped down out of the sky, grabbed the fish, started to fly away with it, got over the green, dropped the fish out of its mouth. The fish hit the ground. The ball popped out of the fish's mouth, went in the hole, hole in one. It was amazing. Jesus said, nice shot, Dad. Thank you. I'm here all week. Try the veal. Um, I think this, this is the idea. This is what we said week one, that that Jesus is saying here, he's saying, you want, to know, you want to know my dad? You want to talk with him? You want to spend time with him? Uh, that's what it's about. That, that's, that's what, that's what he, and Jesus, in, in that first statement, he's giving us permission. Address him for the first time ever in history. Address him as Dad. Let me tell you how that works. And, and last week, Jeff helped us understand that your kingdom come, uh, your will be done is, is about us dying to ourselves. That it's about dying to self and living to his purposes. And today, Jesus goes on to, in, in this prayer to say, give us uh, this day our daily bread. I think uh, this part of the prayer, it seems kind of trivial to us. It's, um, I think that's the point, though, uh, that God cares about even the stuff that we think is little stuff. Um, I want to take some time, and I want to walk through this, this line in the prayer word by word. I want us to understand the perspective and the relationship that Jesus is, is modeling, that he's, he's, he's calling us to in, in prayer. The first word, give. It's an attitude of humility and dependence. That the daily bread isn't ours to begin with. It doesn't belong to us. We, it, it comes from God. I, I don't create the solutions. I don't create the money or the bread in my life. It, it came from him. It comes from him. He is the source. It, somebody said it like this, humble people pray for daily bread, and praying for daily bread humbles people. You just kind of have to chew on that statement for a, a minute. Humble people pray for daily bread. And praying for daily bread humbles people. 
That God, unless you provide, my needs go unmet. It's just simply recognizing that, God, apart from you, I have nothing. The next word is us. Who do you pray for? A lot of people, I think, uh, pray more for others than they do for themselves. And it's because uh, we have this thing with prayer that it's so, uh, we get, um, we start to feel that, like, we feel bad if it's too much about ourselves. And so we will come with, with requests, but Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I love this quote. Um, Eddie Lowen, he's the pastor at Westside Christian Church in Springfield. He, he said, God's favorite part of my story is the part where I trust him. God's favorite part of our story is when we fully trust him. I, I like how the message translates Luke chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. It says, here's what I'm saying. I ask and you will, you will get. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will, will open. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This is not a cat and mouse hide and seek game that we're in. Sure, God knows what we need. But he wants there to be relationship. He still wants us to approach him. He still wants us to come to him. And part of that relationship, a huge part of it, is our dependency on him. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. That verse, in, in another translation, it says, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. I'll just ask you, like, who... Who comes to the king's throne boldly? Do subjects of the kingdom come to the king's throne boldly? Probably not. But can I tell you who does? The king's children. When they're just coming to dad, they come boldly to his throne, unlike anyone else in the kingdom. And I'm just saying, man, Jesus is, is inviting us and he's saying, this is who you are. Come to your dad's throne boldly. The next word is, is today or daily. It's this idea of ongoing or, or constant uh, dependence. One of my favorite hymns, the words of it come from Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Every time the sun comes up, God renews his covenant. Every morning. Every morning, he reaffirms his faithfulness. This is why Jesus could go on in another part of the, the Sermon on the Mount and say, therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself, he says. Like, isn't this the best way? Isn't that concept the best way to combat this pandemic of anxiety that we live in today? I mean, everyone is so anxious. There's so much anxiety. And I, I think the best, the best thing to combat that is to wake up every day and remember that his mercies are renewed today. His faithfulness is great Would you give me today my daily bread? 
It's about believing that God is running the universe and He knows what's best for all of us and I don't. We don't. He knows what's best. I don't know what's best. Even when I think I do. Even when my conversation with Him, it it, 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 it has to do with what I think is best, I still, I still will default to, Father, I know you know better though. I know you do. Give us this day our daily bread. It is a crazy shift in this prayer, isn't it? It really is like a a turning point in the prayer that, that Jesus has started saying, God, my Father in heaven, you are so other than us in every way. You, you are hallowed. And your will will be done here on earth where you reign just as you reign in all of the heavenly places. And can I have a sandwich? Right? Like, but it's not as abrupt as it sounds. See, something that Jesus' listeners would have known that uh, that they would, what, what, what Jesus' words here, give us this day our day, what they would have triggered For his Jewish listeners, the first thing they would have thought of was Moses. Their minds would have gone immediately to Moses, to to their story, the children of Israel. That after they had been set free uh, from captivity in, in Egypt, while they were on their way to the promised land, wandering in the desert because of their own unfaithfulness. With great hunger. Exodus chapter 16, verses 4 and 5 says that, that in that, in, in, in that context, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether they will ask in my law or not, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily, right? Because of the Sabbath. It was called manna. And the shelf life of manna was one day, right? It was good for one day. If they tried to collect more than what they needed for that day and store it up, which they did try to do, uh, it, it spoiled. It would not keep. Except for one day a week it would. Because God was trying to teach them dependence on him for daily bread. And, and, and the interesting part of the story, if you read in Exodus what happened there, uh, the interesting part is when they weren't hungry anymore, when they had had manna for a while, um, manna wasn't good enough anymore. They started grumbling, God, we were better off in Egypt. Um, because even though we were slaves, um, we had meat and spices and stuff. But like, this manna thing is getting old. I just wonder, has that ever happened to you? Has it ever happened to you that your definition of daily bread has changed over time? That maybe daily bread isn't what it once was to you. Your expectations have risen. You aren't satisfied with the daily bread anymore. It's kind of the human way. It's the American way, at least, right? I mean, it's, 
We have whole businesses and websites set up so that we can critique these kinds of things. The food needs, the food needs to be great. The accommodations, the accommodations need to be plush. Uh, the temperature has to be ideal. The clothing should be comfortable. Maybe have some spandex in it so it stretches and I can look good too. And D.L. Moody, he said this, he said, we cannot eat enough food to last for us for the next six months. We cannot take in one breath to sustain our life for a week. Neither can we take in a supply of God's goodness that will last us for the rest of our lives. We must reply, or rely upon God's provision every day. Every day. Jesus, uh, he told a story one time about a, a wealthy farmer. He was a very wealthy farmer who uh, became addicted uh, to more and more. And so he built bigger barns for his stuff. And he thought, I'm going to have more stuff. And I need to be ready for more stuff. And, and then, you know what happened? God said, you're going to die. And he died. And guess what? His stuff was not his stuff anymore. It was somebody else's. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 21, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Paul, when he was training up a, a young ministry partner named Timothy, he wrote to him in 1 Timothy chapter 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Have we forgotten that food and clothing, that godliness and contentment are great gain? That, and I, want, I don't want you to miss it, this, that choosing to be satisfied, choosing to be satisfied is monumental We've forgotten that all the things we think we need, we probably don't really need, that it's better to be satisfied and content because that's what God's word says goes with godliness. Hayden Shaw said it like this, I prefer to have my trust in the spreadsheet of what the Father is doing, not in the Father. How many of us are that way? We want the spreadsheet. We want to know how everything is going to play out. We want to be able to be prepared for everything that's coming next. Uh, and, and the people uh, that Jesus, I, I think the people that he shared this prayer with, uh, man, they were at a great advantage. They, they were paid daily. Do you know that? They got their paycheck at the end of the day, every day. And it, and it had them in this, they were vulnerable. They didn't always know where their next day's meals would come from. And that, 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 the difference is, this has put us at a significant disadvantage. We are, we are at a disadvantage because we have no idea. Why? We think it's us. We think it's from us. This isn't a prayer of luxury or surplus. We are asking today for and what we need to be enough for today.
It brings us to a place of contentment, to a place of gratefulness. Remember that quote I I shared from Eddie that God's favorite part is when I trust him? The one word in this verse that we didn't really talk about is right in the middle of the verse. It's the word our. Our. Give us our daily bread. And maybe, maybe the reason uh, that, that Jesus communicates it this way, maybe what's going on here is, 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 is this realization for us that it handles our disadvantage because uh, he's given me more than my need so that I can practice contentment and be generous with my extra, that, that maybe uh, the reason I have more is to share it. We were meant to share the bread. Not hoard it, not collect it, not keep it. Not compare it. Not lord it over. We were meant to share our bread. It's why we give as an act of worship every week. In church, it's important not because we're, it's an ask for money or anything like that, but because we know that our generosity produces contentment and joy. When I give God my first fruits, not just give, but when I give for, to him first, when I set aside a percentage of what I have to give back to God, it expresses my trust in him. It takes my mind off of what I have and reminds me most of what I need. Giving breaks me of the bigger and better mentality that we have, and it helps me recognize that God is enough. Luke 6.38 Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, will be measured back to you. I was thinking about this verse this week, and um, it was, it's been a while back. Um, I had this conversation with Silas and Peyton. Uh, I think it was on a Wednesday night. <laughs> after uh, we had wrapped up programming over here and I went home with the boys and we were talking and one of them in their class had talked about the feeding of the 5,000 uh, and how Jesus pulled off this miracle. And as I sat with the boys and, and we were just talking about that and talking about this, this story and uh, about how this boy comes with five, five loaves and two fish and he brings them to the disciples and then Jesus takes it and he multiplies it, right? He multiplies it and, and we're talking about how incredible this miracle was, how so many people got fed that day and how there were even a bunch of leftovers, and as we were talking about how God, Jesus, he, there was more than it, and there were leftovers, it triggered for, pa- see, Patey looked at me, and Patey is our eater, okay? Um, Silas, he's picky. He, well, Peyton, we, Peyton will eat, man. And, and Patey looked at me, and he, he said, that, that, that means he got to eat more. And I felt like, I felt like my, my five-year-old son had just shared a deep theological insight with me. I had never thought about that with this story. That this boy, he had but five loaves and two fish. And when he brought them to Jesus and he surrendered it all to Jesus, he gave it all to Jesus. Jesus multiplied it. This boy no longer had five loaves and two fish. He had all the bread and fish he, he wanted to eat and then some. When my trust is in God for my daily bread, church, my contentment and my satisfaction is like more than I can even take.
if you curse me and I will bless you and if you hurt me I will forgive and if you hate me then I will love you and I choose the Jesus way If you're helpless, I will defend you. And if you're burdened, I'll share the way. And if you're hopeless, then let me show you there's hope in the Jesus way. I follow Jesus, I follow Jesus, he wore my sin, I'll gladly wear his name, he is the treasure, he is the answer. If you strike me, I will embrace you. And if you chain me, I'll sing his praise. And if you kill me, my home is heaven. For I choose the Jesus way. service we're going to partake of communion together and as I was listening to Ryan uh, first service and talked about just how kind of we get in the way and how we need God's daily provisions and his teaching and I just I thought about coaching right I mean just kind of what I know what I've known for a long time Um, but this year was something new I I coached t-ball and uh, almost forced to 
because I couldn't find enough help, and, and now I figured out why. <laughs> you think you explain something really well and something really basic, just like throwing. We're going to start right here, glove, ball, and I just, I just we're just going to go back here like we're getting ready to throw the ball. Okay, they got him. All right, ready and go. And the ball's still in the glove. It's like, no, I, I, need, I need the ball in this hand. And then they look at you and they go, but it's in the glove. I know. And then you look over and you're like, hey, stop hitting that guy with a bat over his head. We told you to put the bats on the ground. And then you're over here and this kid's picking flowers. And I'm going, what did I sign up for? I hear parents go, well, that's why I didn't volunteer. But what I love about this coaching T-ball is, man, the kids, like, want to learn, right? They're excited to learn, and, and uh, you, you play little games with them, like call out the bases, and they yell really loud what base it is. And, and, and then I started thinking about high school and my, my coaching there in high school. And, um, man, there's frustrations there, too. It's just a lot different. In, in high school, uh, you get kids who, who already think they know it all. Or you get kids who don't want to put in the work or effort that it takes to, to, to be better. Or they even flat out tell you, like, I don't need to be better. I'm, I'm good where I'm at. My athletic ability, I can do this. I, you know, I, I really don't need you to, to tell me how to do something better. And I just wonder, like, in our daily lives, why we don't make prayer um, so important in our lives is if we think we, we know it all already. Like, I don't need coached. I don't, I don't need told how to do it. Like, I I already have my day planned out. I've already got my week planned out because I've been doing it for so long. And I just remember God just saying, man, we need to be like these little kids. Because as frustrating as the little kids are, uh, we had our first game this week, and some a, a girl that I just met, my coaching, came up and gave me a hug on the leg. And I was like, oh, so okay. Good to see you too. They're, they're, so, they're so innocent, right? And they just want to learn. And I think we lose that as we get older. And so as he talked about in the sermon as well, like we, we, we tend to pray for other people, which is awesome, but there are times that we need to pray for ourselves. And so this morning, man, I just want to pray that, that we get that childlike mentality, that we don't get in a, in a rut, that we don't think we know it all, or I, God, I, listen, I, I've already got my week planned. I, I don't need you telling me what to do or what, I sh- what should I do. I don't need interruptions in my life. I don't need to have a conversation with this person because I've got to, this is really important. Instead, be like these little kids. May God show me today, what do you want me to do? What do I need to do? Coach me in my walk with you. Coach me in my prayer life. I want to learn so much. And so this morning, before we partake in communion, I'm going to give you a few moments with God. And what is it that he's telling you? I, I need you to work on this. I need you to stop and take time. I need you to stop and be still. I need you to see the people around you and make a difference in their lives, whatever it is. I'm going to give you a few moments, and then we're going to partake in communion together. God, forgive us for the times that we think we know it all. Forgive us for the times that we think that we don't have time. We don't have time to talk to you. We don't have time to read your word. We have a plan, and we forget to include you in that. Father, I just pray that this series, especially, Father, that has shown us already how powerful and how important prayer is. 
and not just for others, but also for ourselves, just to have the conversation with you. Father, I pray that you put it on our hearts to take the time to talk with you, to take the time to pray for what your will is for our lives. Don't let us get in the way. Don't let us not be coachable. Don't let us think it needs to happen the way we want it to. But Father, may your spirit guide us as a life coach every day. Father, may we carve out time for you. May we live for you. Father, because of what you did for us, because of the cross and because of Jesus. Father, we thank you just for the opportunity to be able to speak with you. May we use that this week. May you put it on our hearts and in our minds. Father, that we always go to you first and that we always seek your will in our lives every single morning. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. And with that, church, together we'll partake of the bread, which symbolizes Christ's broken body for us on the cross. Together, church, we'll partake of the juice, which symbolizes Christ's spilled blood for us on the cross. As we end our service this morning, I just want to remind every one of our offering just another way in which we worship. Our boxes are up front and in the back as you leave the auditorium. If you're watching with us online, you can give at fccmoinkwood.org or you can text give to the number on the screen. Would you stand with me as I pray? Father God, just ask that you be with the gift and the giver this morning, that you continue to be with our church and the leadership of our church, Father, that we can, Father, use, use the money wisely, Father, that we can find people who need it, and Father, that it's a way for us to minister, it's a way for us to show them who you are. Thank you for this church, thank you for allowing us to be a part of it, thank you for Jesus, it's in his name we pray. Salvation, it cannot be moved.
God. 